Hello and welcome to the Body Meets Mind podcast. Welcome, 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 Tommy. Good to have you on the show, my friend. Yes, mate. Always, always, uh, always a pleasure. I'm, I'm donning the uh, a bit of bit of the grunge scene here, bit of the nineties. I'm actually got. I've got Led Zeppelin, Metallica, um, Nirvana. I'm trying to get a, a bit of a build up of uh, of grunge. Well, obviously Led, Led Zeppelin's not super grunge, but trying to get the '90s back, mate. The origins of grunge, though. Yes, okay. the origins. The origins. The origins. <laughs> but t- today we've got a, t- a really, really special guest on the show. His name is Yotti or Jonathan Kingsley. I personally know him as Yotti. I went to school with him, and uh, he has been on an incredible journey. He's now a tremendous uh, academic with uh, quite a, quite a host of remarkable feats under his belt. Uh, Yodi, welcome to Body Beats Mind. Great to have you on the show, mate. Thanks, Paulie. Lovely to be here. I mean, we've known each other for a very, very long time, so I'm really happy to have a yarn today and um, talk about whatever wherever you want to take me, and uh, we'll go from there. Right, it's great that you don't know where, where we're going because we don't either. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, it's going to be a great show, and we'd like to keep things nice and open and fluid. And um, yeah, uh, just having you speak there just reminded me of your uh, incredible athletic prowess when you first came to Bialy College, our school as well. This guy was like an absolute jet. I mean. He was running uh, for representing state. He was an absolute bullet. I would, I would never go back there. I can't. I can't run like that anymore. Uh, <laughs> certainly not. I, it's it's lucky if I can get around the block now. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, no. Um, I remember those days. Uh, but you know, they they're long gone now. The muscles have gone. But what is, what is interesting, and I, I just want to create a little bit of context here because you really have um, developed a career for yourself around academia and things that have become really, really important uh, to you. And we'll kind of flesh that out uh, as we continue to talk, but the origins of when we knew each other uh, and we were going to skip uh, to school together, you know, uh, sport was a really, really big identity for you. And like we were talking off camera, myself and you included, uh, you know, academia was not really, we didn't identify as, um, you know, bookworms, et cetera. So I'm really interested to know how that transition took place because I personally found high school quite challenging and I, I feel like you, you may have been in that boat as well. Yeah, no, I, I definitely um, had my challenges during uh, primary school and high school. Uh, I stayed down in grade five because uh, I couldn't keep up. And um, I had a um, speech, uh, well, an auditory impediment and also a speech impediment, which uh, slowed me down um, and uh, led to frustrations with uh, basic stuff like reading and writing. Uh, and then it slowed me down. But I, I guess... It, it led to what then allowed me to grow. Um, and often when we have challenges in our life, whatever they are, if you harness them and then kind of work with them, which I did, uh, I had to work really hard to catch up with everyone else in school. And, and I probably just got there by year 12, um, you know, with, with everyone else. And then um, that led me to kind of strive for academically for me um, bigger things. Um, and you know, it just kept on snowballing, snowballing. And, and eventually I had to say no to things, you know, go, I, I ended up getting into medicine, which was a dream at one point and then realized actually I was tri- striving by other people's dreams. And my dream was teaching and doing big picture population health, pu- public health stuff that I'll talk about with you. Um, and trying to come up with solutions to big problems in society around health and wellbeing and, um, psychological issues that people are going through and trying to deal with them at a, at a bigger level, uh, you know, and I just kept on pushing, pushing, pushing until I, I reached the point I wanted to reach. And I think everyone can get in mm-hmm. it. It takes a lot of hard work. I'm like, I'm so fascinated. I just want to sit here for a moment. We, we will get to uh, the public policy and health stuff that you've been able to uh, really, really flesh out and become, make an cre- incredibly successful career out of it. Just sitting internally on how you were able to bridge that gap between someone who was really struggling academically and having that identity shift and then 
like you said, you stepped, you stepped into your confidence in year 12 and then like exploding into this other completely unprecedented level of academia. Did you feel like, like what was going on for you? Did you feel like you had a point to prove to others, to yourself? What was going on there? Yeah. So I, I, I definitely felt like I was always having to prove myself and that proving myself finished when I, I finally got into medicine. I was studying this and I was like, actually, I don't want to do this anymore. I don't need to prove anything to anyone anymore. Um, and I, I wanted to forge my own path of my passion. So there was a lot of proving myself. Um, and it was a lot of just kind of in build, you know, um, always that catching up, catching up. Uh, I, like even the way I used to write it in my books at school, I used to bend my paper so no one could see anything I was writing because there's a bit of a shame around it. So there was other things going on as well. It wasn't just proving myself. It was probably a shame that I, I wasn't as good as anyone else around. Mm -hmm. and, and you can adapt that to kind of anything we feel in society with someone's better or, you know, we can't do something that someone else can. But there will always be people like that. But if, if you put your best foot forward, you just keep on going. And you, you probably see this with the exercise and people you train, you know, there will be the improvements that people won't notice immediately, but they will notice over years if they continue it. 100. Yeah, fan. It's interesting, isn't it? It's really interesting. So the, 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 the part that sticks out to me the most um, is that, and with, with only having met you, um, uh, Yachty, over the, you know, I saw the past 20 minutes or so, it sounds like the point that you've got to now wasn't necessarily a place that you had always destined to 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 get to. Did what was the journey like? And, and the, the the area that I'm kind of trickling down to here is, you know, how do I find my passion? Is such a big topic, such a big question this day and age. And again, in all different facets, doesn't matter if you're a holistic health coach, a psychologist, a counselor, whatever it is, an academic. You know, young people in their twenties, and you know, are really, how do I find my passion? How do I find my purpose? What was your journey to finding? that and 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 what are some advice you could give to some of our younger adults um i i guess it uh it came down to you know i, I was passionate about sports pushing myself and that was probably a drive thing um and, and i started off in that direction and then realized that wasn't exactly what i wanted to continue with and it was more helping people in community and um that journey started working in Aboriginal uh, communities in the Kimberleys and Pilbara probably around 20 years ago um, and realizing how privileged I was as a human being and how um, I wanted to help other people who weren't as privileged um, and, and not saying I didn't have my struggles. Obviously I had my learning children and all these other things and people always have struggles in their lives. I'm, you know, but I, I saw people living in a house which should have only fit in four people and there was 25 people living in that house. Um, you know, and that, that's ext some extreme poverty I saw and, and I wanted to help. And, and that started the journey off. And how do I work to bridge health inequalities in society? Um, how do I help populations who may not have the same abilities as, as us? And that was my real passion. And that kind of came from my parents. Um, and we usually take on what our parents say. My dad was a community doctor. You know, it, a lot of people went to my dad. A lot of people came to my dad when they needed him. It kind of, they came through my house because it was kind of joint. My dad would do house calls, you know, we would be secretaries in that, in that office. So we got to know people. We got to know the community. You know, if people got sick at school, bully people used to go to my dad sometimes, you know, um, that's awesome. Isn't it? You know, so uh, there was a general on the bed and my mum was the boss. So, you know, <laughs> surgery. Um, so there was always community kind of want to do something. So that was probably my driving point and I had to find that passion for myself. Some people with fashion is very different. It might be about money. It's, I mean, all different things, but you got to find your passion within that. Um, and mine's, yeah. you know, um, to be stable, um, mm -hmm. but to help others. Love that. So, you so, see, so this passion was pretty undeniable. Driving you towards you know, uh, your tertiary education, as you mentioned, you were going down the path of studying medicine and you were really, really like, it was clear the, you obviously got some clarity in that study that a, you had a greater calling or should I say a different calling 
um, and, and B, you were you no longer needed to prove anything. No. Your 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 pull towards your truth was much greater than any any proving that needed to happen. So, so you find yourself, you know, living in communities, but also studying this, um, uh, studying academically. Let's talk about that. What what was the beginning of your uh, academic um, journey, and where are you now? So, I mean, that started in honors. Um, when I started to look at my major research pad passion and my major passion is around gardening and health. Um, so I looked at community gardening and the health benefits of community gardening and um, how that improves people's health and wellbeing. And I did that as an honors project back in 2004. Um, and I became really close with one of the lecturers. Um, and I, and I love that thing, but I didn't Port Melbourne, a very wealthy um, population in Port Melbourne. And I was like, I want to work somewhere doing something different and working with communities that may not have the same kind of um, uh, benefits we have. So then that it started that journey off, started working as a cultural health researcher in the Kimberleys and had a fantastic uh, mentor, um, Anne Paulina, who's um, an, a professor now um, in Notre Dame in um, Broome. Uh, and she's also a traditional owner of uh, Niganak people. Um, and she told me about culture and health. And that kind of made, that made me realize that the importance of our environments and nature just people's health and wellbeing. Mm. Um, so we can learn a lot from Indigenous people um, about connection to country. You would have heard about welcome to countries or acknowledgement to countries. Uh, you would have seen them um, on TV. So, you know, I, I started to immerse myself in that and started to realize it's a bigger thing of people connecting with nature, improving their health. And, and Paul, I think you've talked about this a little bit of getting outdoors, doing exercise, you know, it, it's just as basic as that. Like, you know, there are great benefits from just being outside, going for bushwalk, going for surf, whatever it is that, you know, go gardening, whatever it may be that will improve your health. And it started that academic kind of wants to know what the connection between nature and health started kind of being honors kind of built up through Aboriginal connection to country and then kind of brought in that to everything of um, how, you know, even environmental destruction impacts our health. And wealth. Mm, I love that. That's amazing. And it's so important in this day and age, you know, and I think, you know, even if you just think about, you know, one's life anecdotally, I, I know for me that I feel calmer, uh, more humble when I can see the stars at night because I, I can recognize the, the wonderful humility in my insignificance, you know, and, and how, and, and I, I've read some of the studies on how looking out at a, at a landscape can, can help reset some of the, the, the pain that's associated with being highly attentive or one specific thing. I, I think even as well, Johan Hari writes a lot about the, the social benefits of gardening for, for people overcoming drug and health addiction. So you're, your area would just go into so many interesting areas of research. I, I can't imagine. Yeah. And look, this isn't a new area at all. Like I don't know if you've ever heard, heard of the theory biophilia, which is we've been hunting gatherers for 99% of human existence. Mm. Uh, we, that DNA is imprinted in our kind of systems. And, and there are actually studies starting to prove this, mm. that we need that. We need to be able to see the stars. We need to be able to connect with nature, not just, um, it, it's, it, yeah, it's part of us. Yeah. Um, and that love of nature is part of our, a part of us. And, and uh, you may, I think it's Gaia, which says that we're at equilibrium and we're small in comparison to other things like that, in, that feeling of insignificance you get when you, you're out in nature, you go, I'm, I'm part of a bigger piece of the world. Yep. Um, type of thing and there's so many theories like attention restoration theory which they call ask which is part of the therapeutic horticulture which means when you get out into gardening or or nature um it will reduce the fatigue it will increase your attention we'll do all these things mm -hmm. um, and that was a theory that came out 40 50 years ago in the environmental psychology so these theories are definitely not new um and a lot of people would be talking about them it's it's so cool when there are so many, um, like Tom said, so many aspects um, and so many departments of one's health and society that, um, you know, 
what your your thesis has been able to explore and has been able to be applicable to. So I'd love to just drill down a little bit on what your study has been and yep. also what your findings have been because like, you know, I, yeah, I've done my own research, but uh, it was really pales in comparison. Are you saying you're smarter than uh, Johnny there, Paul? I don't think it's PhD. Hey, Wikipedia. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Wikipedia PhD. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but, but Yachty, let's, let's drill down because I'm personally am aware, like anecdotally of what happens to me when I train in nature or when I take my, my shoes off and I, uh, you know, and, and I, and I'm in contact with the, yeah. like, when I'm gardening, when I'm doing all these types of things, yes. Okay. There's theories out there and you can say that they can contribute towards what you're feeling at the time, but. I feel I have a sense that it's very real, and I also know that science backs it up. So let's let's break this down and tell tell us exactly what your um, hypothesis was and how you went down the path of um, what you did. So let me start start to start with the specific kind of benefits, and then I'll drill down into why maybe. So like we're starting to do studies where we're looking at things like cardiovascular disease and risk markers of people's heart conditions you know, uh, um, uh, blood pressure, uh, uh, rates of, um, they're called cardiovascular risk markers. Mm -hmm. And, and what we're seeing is when people, uh, participate in gardening and with big, large samples, like 5,000 people, uh, when people participate in gardening, they're going to have better outcomes longitudinally, um, with, uh, gut doing gardening activities, but not just doing gardening activities in small amounts. You probably need to do it up to 150 minutes per week. So kind of like your prescription for physical activity. So you you probably know the WHO um, guidelines for physical activities around 150 minutes of moderate activity. Mm -hmm. So um, I'd, most gardening activities are roughly around moderate, moderate activity. Mm -hmm. You have to have your low intensity kind of activities like watering of plants, which are important um, to a high intensity where you're digging holes. Yeah, but um, what this is showing is if you get up to 150 minutes of gardening per week, you're going to have a reduced your likelihood of cardiovascular risk markers later on. Same with the environmental um, kind of fact, uh, psychological factors like we've measured well-being and um, happiness scales. And what we're seeing is people are happy when they participate in 150 minutes. And it's kind of a beautiful curve that shows that this is happening, but there are certain populations that get these benefits more than others. So um, older adults seem to get these benefits more than young adults. And there's good reason for that because we probably need to do a little bit more physical activity than someone who's 65. Um, but there's still are the benefits of anyone doing gardening. Okay, so you, you get in barefoot and and getting out of the garden will have psychological and physical benefits. The, the data is telling us that and even cognitive ability, as I talked about in terms of reducing fatigue and, and stress levels. Um, and even we've done studies during COVID-19 of there was definite reduction of the stress people were getting when they were participating in gardening during the early stage of the lockdown. So we've got that data. Yodi, can I just, uh, I just want to uh, just dig into that just a moment. Yeah. On the bun. Yeah, so I was going. I was going to <laughs> um, Let me just flower this garden bed for a second here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'll throw a few seeds out there. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, I, w I wanted to uh, just see if there were any uh, direct correlation. You, you said that there was a direct correlation between the the, the act of gardening and uh, longevity when it comes to cardiovascular health and um, your, your your mental well being, but. Is there any uh, activity or uh, habit or anything that specifically can be drawn to these types of things? Do you know what I mean by that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've, I've got to be careful here to also. Yeah, yeah. Causality is really hard to prove, and especially for outdoor activities. Yeah. Um, so we believe it's happening, but there may be other factors going on. So people who have gardens are uh, often... Um, wealthier yep. often um who have more time to garden for leisure um you know so there may be other factors going on we try to um in the scales measure against those factors 
Yeah. Um, but causality is a really hard thing. And this probably the research isn't quite there to say exactly these gardening activities will get you these benefits, but we do know there is something going on. Yeah. Like the data is telling us there's something going on, but we haven't got that sophisticated to give you exact details. Yeah, grand causality. So I have to fix myself up there. It's not perfect. Yeah, yeah. Boss. Yep. Okay. Well, right. Yeah. Sorry, Paul. I was just going to say, in, what about then, Yodi? Do you know how much of the variance is associated with gardening specifically in terms of those benefits as opposed to just physical activity in general? So if, yeah, in one of our papers, we just had to redo our analysis to put in physical activity and see if it was, it seemed to the data was seeming to do exactly the same thing. Okay. So it was showing us the garden was good no matter what if you added physical activity onto it. Yep. Um, but a, again, it, it may be the people who are doing physical activity in gardening. So like there may be other variables going on. So, you know, we, we do know that people who can do physical activity for leisure are probably in the socioeconomic status, have a, you know, higher socioeconomic status. Is that a big issue? Don't know. Yeah, but there's something definitely going on. Yeah. And again, you're probably seeing that with data with physical activity anyway, with them not telling you that, you know, um, it's, it's not a, it's not beautiful. The, the bell isn't beautiful when you're talking about this, but we definitely yep. do know some is going on. Yeah. So, yeah. Collective. So I remember doing um, correlations at uni and, um, you know, you can, you can, you can do all of the, you can take all of these, uh, take all this data and do and run cor- correlation analyses. And then you've got these wonderful um, <laughs> conclusions to draw from them, but without looking at the variance and, and the effect size, you know, which is like, you know, how much, how much do we know that this, variable is specifically associated with this one in other words you know um oh it's isn't it interesting that uh you know the rooster crows in in you know it does cockadoo in the in the morning therefore roosters cause the sun to rise you know it's like if you look at the the effect size it's probably pretty small <laughs> it, it's it's a yeah it, it's a conundrum that everyone has and like it comes down to when you start this is why i want to going back to what we're talking about the big picture stuff yeah, there are so many things affecting our health, both positive and negative. But to work out any single one that's causing the most is really, really difficult. And and that's why I love working in this space because you're trying to like deal with big, big issues because they will never probably have an answer by the time, even if I do this in 40 years. Yeah. 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 Um, but you, you're dealing with the issues that, um, quite frankly, I couldn't imagine anything more important dealing with the the health and well being of individuals and communities in the world where you know uh, you're, you're also creating you're, you've chosen a vehicle or a modality in that um, really uh, counteracts a lot of the bombardment of technology that um, we're completely showering ourselves with day to day. So that there's got to be some form of alter, you know. But what I was getting at previously when I asked the question was, you know, like we know with grounding there's negative ions and there's a connection between, you know, the bottoms of our, of our feet. But to me it just kind of makes sense that is, if you're in connection with nature more often, that's mm-hmm. going to be an offset to the man-made technology that we that we completely bombard ourselves with nowadays. Yeah, it, 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 that, that's definitely, it, it is the circuit breaker. And we saw that during the COVID-19 research, like mm. the time people had at home to then go outside and do gardening, they, they, you know, people weren't just sitting in front of the TV. They were actually doing things that were probably really worthwhile for themselves. Even though people bloody hated lockdowns, um, they probably had to sit still and do things that were you know, natural. <laughs> Yes, I, I now know how to bake a loaf of bread 470 yeah. ways. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty good. I'm to do that. <laughs> I'm pretty sure every second one of my friends was were baking loaves of bread. <laughs> oh, so good. Yeah, on, exactly on the screen. <laughs> yeah. It's um, interesting. But, uh, uh, what, sorry, I wanted to talk about um, how the world has seen, you know, how the world has treated the the question of um, the environment uh, over the last 20 years since you've been heavily researching it? Yeah, so um, th- there's a couple of things. I think the research has come a long way. Like, so the data I just talked about, 
you know, of getting hard facts. That wasn't probably there 20 years ago. There was maybe a handful of studies that could do that. There's more at a qualitative level. So we'd talk about, you know, people's description of the guard and all those different things and how beneficial the law and um, so the, the, the research has come a long way, um, from 2004 to yes. 2022. And there, there are a lot of more people working in this space in terms of, of gardening. It was probably seen as a bit of a joke back then, um, in 2004, the gardening was a bit of a hippie activity. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, similar to walking, what walking was, you know, doctors would be prescribing walking. In 1990, they'll be laughed at. Mm, like, yeah. Why are you prescribing this stuff to us? Now we know that's actually very good for us. Same with gardening. Yeah. Um, we, my, I have a colleague who was in, sitting in standing desks in the 1990s, and he, that was seen as a bit of a joke back then, and now it's not a joke at all um, of why you need to do these things. So uh, people were trying the um, – people knew it was beneficial dissipated. Yeah. But they were, you know, the therapeutic horticulture people and, you know, a bit alternative. Mm -hmm. um, as was walking, you know, people who used to do bush walking as a kind of activity back in the 90s, it was a bit of a hobby thing, whereas now we know it's good for your health. Yeah, 100%. <laughs> so yeah. things have progressed in, in, a lot, I think, um, in that time. I think one of the reasons why it, it was probably seen as a bit of a hippie thing was because one of the really interesting um, externalities to come out of the um, the psychedelic movement in the 60s was that all of the hippies became very, very environmentally conscious as a kind of, um, like I said, an, an externality of taking these psychedelic substances. Not only were they much more empathetic and connected to, to self and other, they were also much more connected to the environment. And... Um, anyway, just as a, as a, as a, as a side, um, point, I was wondering if you could perhaps, um, elaborate on some of the evolutionary theories as to why gardening, um, might be viewed as really beneficial for us, you know, even, even just to my way of thinking, you know, being able to press a button and have food come to us now is something Paulie and I talk about on this podcast all the time, but having to nurture plants that then nurture us is, is obviously something that we we literally relied on to live. So yeah, I was wondering if you'd elaborate on some of that. Yeah. So the, I mean, the, it, it, there's a spectrum of reasons why people feel the way uh, there's the therapeutic kind of thing of being outside and slowing down and, and being, you know, um, seeing things grow around you and having to nurture and, and tend it. So um, mm. it may sound silly, but uh, they did a podcast recently on ABC where they just talked about beekeeping and um, using it for people who've come back from uh, duty in the army uh, for post-traumatic um, stress uh, they've had. And the slowing down has allowed them to reflect and then actually deal with the issues they've had. So... There's that element of just seeing things grow, slowing down, and, and just being um, outside, yep. um, whether it be raining, snowing, or really hot, and just being in touch with, with the environment. Um, there's also, like, you can go down a spectrum of these are activities that you probably participated possibly with your grandparents, your parents, um, and it's a kind of nostalgic kind of thing that you're having that uh, you you may grow some flowers are, and the smells remind you of uh, what your grandmother's backyard used to be like or they used to be on a farm and you hear this a lot um, when you speak to community gardeners, why they, they're involved in it is because they've had the past and that motivates them to be gardeners now. Um, it's also exercise. So mm -hmm. purely like it's, it's hard work when you get into garden and you do five hours of gardening. Like you're sore. Yes, just, absolutely. Yeah, so like... And then you're growing your own food. Like a lot of people had um, issues during COVID-19 when we start to see toilet paper go and all of these other things um, that, you know, our food systems were crashing and our systems around kind of us were, were crashing. So people want to be a bit more sustainable. So it gives people a way of being activists without having to leave their home. Mm, yes. So, um, so th there are so many, there's, there's more and more elements of why people do it. And it probably depends on the individual of what motivates them to get to that point. 
um, you, you, you know, Paul, you like to take off your shoes and be out there. I, I'm not one to take off my shoes when I'm gardening. It doesn't mean I don't enjoy it like you do. Oh. Just for a different kind of experience. And, and that's what makes it very, very hard to measure the gardening and gardening experience. So we all kind of slightly have different drivers to participate and <laughs> what it's keeping us there. And some of it's social or some of it's just isolated. Um, all different reasons for it. I, for now, one, love the experience of actually uh, gardening with my my daughter. It's just uh, a tremendous bonding activity, and it's amazing to see how intuitive they are and how how much they're drawn to wanting to uh, to see and how much pride they take in watching these seed, seedlings kind of grow. Um, and intuitively understanding and knowing that this is kind of the circle of life in the agricultural space. Mm. It's pretty special to watch. And I take tremendous pride in it as well. It's like, you know, when I get, when, when someone comes around to my place, I'm like, check out my veggies. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It, 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 uh, you know, I do that too. Like I, I, I take hundreds of pictures of to my, my tomatoes. There's a pride around it, like from last summer. Um, but, but every life course of different kind of things you're doing with it. Like your, your daughter is learning. Yes. Um, whereas you probably have already done the learning. You're kind of, you're doing mastery or you know, other things with it that, um, and pride and empowerment for you where it's probably empowerment for your daughter, but at a different level of, um, you know, for the first time growing your own seedling, we've done that for a while. Yes, uh, it's uh, it's an amazing. It's it's uh, it, it. I mean, I can you can also imagine people getting into these wonderful flow states when when gardening. You know, you know, you can you can. I mean, even myself, I'll, I'll mow the lawns and I'll I'll look back and I'll be looking at the lawn for like bloody twenty minutes. I never thought I'd be my dad, but here I am. You know, <laughs> pretty young at twenty nine and just looking at this lawn for for twenty minutes or so. But, um, Yodi, I was wondering if you could start to talk about um based upon the research that you've conducted, the research that you've read, what are some of the wider implications um, of, 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 of how gardening and agriculture and, and the environment and lard and so forth, um, what, a, what, what our world is doing and where that's going to take us for better or for worse. And I can't help but feel a little bit pessimistic, but I'm hoping you can uh, maybe feel a little bit better about it, but maybe not. <laughs> well, uh, I, I wrote a, a paper about this of um, urban agriculture, so gardening and changing the way we grow things. Um, you know, uh, you talk about mowing the lawn, maybe it's about putting in native plants over that. Like, and there, there, there's a whole learning that has to go on with this. Um, but uh, urban agriculture is a nature-based solution to a lot of the issues we're facing. We have, you have nature strips, uh, which are underutilized currently across Australia, Australian cities, okay? You you don't have to grow fruit there, but you can put in flowers to, you know, bees could then pollinate other, you know, gardens. Um, there, I think from memory, there's at least uh, 30% of Sydney's which can be growing much better. Um, you know, there's space. Uh, so you have an ability to um, turn your nature strips into something pretty amazing. Uh, you so there's there's a transition right there, at, you know, and that offsets water runoff, uh, so it goes into the soil rather than going into the back into the sea. Um, and uh, you know, you have a whole bunch of other things. You can grow trees when you know there's there's a whole bunch of different things you can grow fruit, and it makes no sense to me that a lot of people in Melbourne have lemon trees, you know, and they're not sharing them. Yeah, you know, like there's a whole network of people who can come together and grow communities here if we really want to share food, a whole bunch of other things. But I, I guess that takes communities shifting the way they are. Yeah. And, um, so, yeah, I'm pessimistic about kind of what's going on in the world in terms of environmental change. Um, yes, you are. Uh, but, you know, there are solutions right outside your door. Mm, that's true. You know, you you can change. I mean, my whole street is just grass with a couple of trees smattered in between it. Like it's under utilization of uh, the environment completely. And then obviously there are issues around um, 
the soil might not be perfect, um, but yet that's why you put in flowers and um, native plants. Mm -hmm. uh, um, so that's one thing. Then you can grow your own food, um, sharing, bring communities together. But, you know, there, there's all these kind of um, forces going on. So if we say, you know, build, do more gardening, but what we're currently doing, we have to do is um, gentrification. Mm -hmm. Uh, and that means in my area where, where I live, it's like townhouses over houses. So you, you have less space to garden in. Um, there is a leap for that because there's not enough space for people. So you have all these bosses going on and who has the right to make those calls in the past in Melbourne's probably developers who make the calls over, um, people in community for community benefits. Um, but where should the line be drawn, mm -hmm. uh, um, you know, and that, that's where I guess empowers people to make changes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Um, and it would, and so can we, yeah, adapt it better. And I can imagine that, um, being a researcher, you know, one might feel compelled to take a particular political stance because it, after you just, you read enough research. One thing I love about, so, so just for context, I'm doing a psychological science degree right now. Um, and you know, the more you do, do, um, do the kind of, uh, research that you're into and obviously there's bias with all of that, but it, it, it does compel you to start looking at the political, uh, realm in particular areas. Um, do you, do, do you, does any of your work inform policymakers, um, directly or what, what, what's your part to play in that? I would hope so. It's very hard to, I mean, I've worked in government as well in NGOs. Um, so I know you, you're always trying to lobby to government. Um, so, you know, politicians have to, they probably have an opinion you have to find a politician who will work with you and push it. Mm -hmm. I've had that before. I've worked with politicians and, told, you know, um, a lot of my document, a lot of my research has ended up in government documents. Um, but again, this is where, you know, it seems joke. If you think about it in the nineties, I had, I have a friend who's a professor now, um, Neville Owen, who's very well known. And he was, you know, in the nineties, people would have laughed and not, you know, engaged in policy and sitting in a standing desk. Now, you know, he actually incorporated, you know, the, um, I think it was in the census. Uh, so, you know, it, it it's small steps now, hopefully yeah. in 20, 30 years, people recognize in government how important gardens are. And hopefully before there's not much, you know, we lose too much garden spaces within cities. Yeah. That's, that's a, that's a mental resilience as, as a, as a, an academic that, that is working on things such as what you are need to kind of, uh, have, have a mindset for, right? It's like what I'm, what I'm doing may not be applicable or it may not take action for today, but, it, but tomorrow's and definitely future generations will have a tremendous impact. But it isn't that life, like if you want short term birth with your body or whatever, yep. you, you're not going to get the health benefits. Like Absolutely. it's, it's a, it's a ma marathon that we have to do. We have to work on ourselves all through our life. Yeah. It doesn't just happen. No, if we let it go, it, it, it's gone. So, you know, yeah. Well, it, it's it's life. Yeah. It's like, Philosophically, if we, we we draw that line between short term satisfaction, long term gratification, it's like we're we're cultivating a society that demands short term satisfaction, but that's not that's not the key to the success. I mean, to be able to have these and success looks differently to everybody, you know. But the the idea of being able to actually achieve something requires that long term uh, strategy and plan that you think you're talking about. Yeah. And to build communities, doesn't it? I mean, unless you're put in a situation like COVID where communities had, you know, had to be built very quickly, um, you know, it is a long game. Yep. It's that, um, well, yeah. it's that ex expression that, um, yeah, I was going to say, it was just so applicable. It's, um, societies grow great when people plant trees under which they'll never sit. You know, when you're constantly building that thing and doing it for other people, um, it's, uh, it is, it's postponing not only your own gratification, but society's gratification, um, to, 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 to building something amazing. Which is a really hard sell for politicians, right? Oh yes. <laughs> you can and this is yeah. why three year cycles and, um, you know, uh, 
you know, just chucking things at people doesn't work. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, it's, it's been such a great chat. Uh, I felt like we, we touched on a lot of, uh, things, not just wellness, uh, environment, but, but also, uh, how, what your personal journey has been into the field and uh, how you've gotten to where you are. And I personally, uh, I've had a blast. So thank you so much for jumping on the show. No problems. And look, if you do, I've gone into more of detail on gardening and health. If people want to know it uh, on YouTube. Uh, so I've got a YouTube channel called Talking Health Benefits of Gardening with Dr. Yodi. Um, can you so uh, can Google we'll, that? We'll put that in the show notes uh, without awesome. that. So just give us the, the exact uh, link and we'll do that. And is there anywhere else that, you, um, that we can find you on the interwebs? Yeah, so um, I can send you, there's, I've got a web pay, a, a website for Swinburne. So if people want to check out the research, they could go there. Um, I'll send you some links like Google Skull, all that. So if people want to read the um, articles, all those different things. Great. I've put them in, but um, the YouTube channel is probably the best one if people want to know the, the get into the more detail of uh, the benefits of gardening. Because yeah, you can't. I, I, I think I did twenty two shows this year just the benefits, um, oh. and you didn't get very far. So wow, well, twenty two uh, twenty shoot twenty two shows on the benefits. It sounds fantastic, and I, I can't wait to dive in myself. Mm. Cool. <laughs> You've been a lady. Thank you both, um, Tom and Paul. It'd be lovely to chat, and we will chat properly soon, Paul. We haven't chatted for a while. Now, you know where we're going to go? Where? Yeah, we're going to catch up for uh, a, a spite to eat at the Tivoli. Oh, all right. Remember, we, that's where we used to go back in the day. was not is that the um, the one on Danny on the road? Oh, geez. The, yeah, that's still it. <laughs> the, the German house. I'm vegetarian, so I'll have to get the alternative to the sheep. Yeah, we'll get we'll get the vegetarian ham hock. <laughs> Beautiful. All right, guys. Thank you so much for listening. We'll, we'll uh, speak to you next week. Bye-bye.